Hello, this is Betty Hurley Gasgupta, and I'm here with Marge Robeson, and we are going to talk briefly today about super crunchers. Marge was the one who introduced me to Ian's book, and so our talk is, is based in, in part on um, a book written a number of years ago by Ian Ayers called Super Crunchers. And this is a picture of him uh, from his website. Uh, he's written a, a, a number of books, and I'll let Marge tell you a little bit more about him. Thanks, Betty. Uh, Ian Ayers' book, Super Crunchers, was my introduction to the whole topic of big data. Uh, the fact that um, we generate a lot of data now. Every time you do a Google search, that information is collected. And uh, it can be used to analyze uh, various trends and the things that people are interested in. Uh, it's often used by marketers to determine how to present um, a product to you. Uh, and Ian's book, Super Crunchers, uh, talks a lot about how that's done and uh, a little bit about some of the problems with it. Thanks, Marge. And um, what Marge and I decided to do was, was to just talk about a few examples to give you an idea of, of uh, what it means to be a super cruncher. And uh, so um, I'm going to um, talk about two that actually come from Ian's website in which he has a, a whole list of um, prediction, what he calls prediction tools. So this is one he has um, that uh, talks about your uh, disease risk. And uh, what it does is uh, you would go to this site and uh, we'll provide the, the link on the VizMath uh, site. So you need to go to the VizMath uh, site to get uh, this link. Um, and uh, you would answer a number of questions. And based on the way you answer those questions, it will then tell you uh, what your risk is of certain diseases. And on this slide, it shows a few of the choices, um, your risk of cancer, diabetes, and heart disease. Um, and so it's, it's, it's based on um, a mathematical model where uh, in preparation for uh, this um, a questionnaire or this quote unquote uh, prediction of your risk is, is based on a lot of research that's, that's done that looks at the a relationship um, between um, certain characteristics and uh, these diseases. Uh, this also is uh, something from um, Ian's book and um, it's, it's from um, the website Lulu. And what uh, they've done is they've uh, uh, put together a, a data on uh, book titles and how successful those titles are. And then what you do is you put in your um, the book title you'd like to use, and it will uh, give you a percentage of uh, an indicator of, of how popular uh, that title may be um, in comparing it with other um, how other titles have been popular or not popular. Uh, yeah, Betty, um, the title Super Crunchers was actually uh, found that way. Um, the, another tool that you can try out is Google Trends. Um, we all know that Google collects information on our searches. Well, you can put that to use yourself. Uh, I uh, went in and uh, did a little search. You go to your usual Google page, click on More, and then on Even More, and Google Trends is linked under the specialized search terms. And you can just type in your search term and see what happens. 
what I typed in was Hurricane Sandy, and the next slide will show the results. Okay, here we can see that uh, interest in the term Hurricane Sandy uh, peaked in um, early November of 2012. Uh, I searched on the last 90 days. And uh, there was also a map that uh, showed which states had the highest volume of searches. And to my great surprise, Vermont actually had more searches than any other state on the term Hurricane Sandy. Um, I got interested in this because my son told me about it. His uh, seven-year-old came home from school with headlights. And he searched on headlights and uh, found out that it peaks in September. And uh, then it uh, trails off in uh, the winter months. So I, I think um, uh, hopefully we uh, we've uh, gotten uh, your your interest here in in terms of how uh, working with large sets of data uh, can uh, be very helpful in in terms of getting a, a, a better sense certainly of of, um, of our world. And uh, Ian says also uh, there is a, a predictive value to it. So now Marge is going to talk a little bit, though, about correlation versus uh, causation, because that's uh, certainly very important here. Yes, uh, it's easy to be very enthused about the opportunities presented by big data. Uh, but we have to be a little bit careful, because just be because there's a relationship between two things doesn't necessarily mean that uh, one of them causes the other. My favorite correlation versus causation relationship is that um, intelligence, IQ, is positively correlated with uh, foot size, which means the bigger your feet, the more you have the higher your IQ in general. Of course, we can quickly see that that's related more to age in both cases than it is to big feet making people smarter. Um, there are several uh, people in psychology who have uh, done important work on our inability to predict well. And um, correlation um, relationships can uh, improve our ability to predict as long as we're a little bit careful about assigning uh, cause. Uh, but we tend to look for a story in the data. And if um, our intuitive mind is satisfied by the story we find, then our rational analytical mind may not uh, come into play at all. Uh, and uh, we just uh, assign um, causation to uh, whatever uh, satisfies our intuitive mind. Well, uh, thank you very much, uh, Marge. I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, re regression. Uh, keeping in, in, in mind what Marge said in terms of correlation versus causation, um, but uh, taking the correlation in, in mind. So when you're talking about correlation in a mathematical sense, you are talking about the relationship uh, between two factors. Uh, and uh, as Marge said, you need to be careful that you don't um, make the mistake of thinking that one causes the other factor. But just how are these two factors uh, related? So you certainly could do a graph, as uh, uh, Marge mentioned, of IQ versus foot size. Or, or you, you could do uh, something like um, um, age uh, versus um, 
um, the likelihood of heart disease or, or, or something um, to that effect. Um, but what regression um, does is it, it uh, takes uh, that correlation. So if you imagine you, you have a graph um, with um, a bunch of um, points on it. And each of the points represents um, a, a, the factor uh, or how the first thing is measured, like maybe foot size, uh, and let's make that the x value. And then the corresponding y value, or what what you're trying to find the uh, the connection with. In the case, maybe IQ or um, uh, probability of lung disease or whatever that factor is. So you you have a, a whole bunch of, of dots on your page or on your graph. And these dots um, may be all over the place, which means there isn't much correlation at all or connection. Or um, they, they may even uh, uh, gather around so that you, you can almost see a line coming out, out of um, that correlation. And if, if you do um, get something that looks uh, like it at least uh, is forming some kind of a line, then what, what people do is what's called a regression, which is to, to find the, the best line that fits through those points. Um, and so that's called a regression line. And the regression line is what is being used in these uh, prediction models that Ian talks about. And uh, March, uh, why don't you talk a little bit more about that? Right. Very early in the book, um, Ian presents a regression model uh, for uh, predicting the years that will uh, produce valuable wines. And uh, it turns out that the equation, the regression equation, actually does a better job than the expert taste testers. Um, because it includes uh, really only two factors. It includes the rainfall during the, the grape growing season and uh, the amount of sunshine. And those are, it makes sense that those are critical factors in producing a fine wine. And um, it's, it's caused quite a bit of upset, I guess, <laughs> among the uh, expert wine testers that an equation can be so accurate in predicting the best wine years. So um, go, go ahead. Well, I'll talk for a minute, and then um, March, uh, you've done some more research on on this. So uh, to uh, to talk about what why Ian says, uh, as in the, the the wine case, which is a great example, um, and he he does have um, that predictor on his website. Um, uh, why are we so bad at predicting? And, and one of the things he talks about is that we're, we're overconfident. Um, and he, in the book, he gives a series of, of questions and asks people to give the minimum and maximum value for where they think that happened. For example, you know, uh, a, yeah, a year of, a, of, a, um, of Martin Luther King's death, for example. And um, most people uh, uh, predict a range, and, and then their answer actually doesn't fall in that range. And uh, so we, we tend to be a little bit overconfident about how good we are at predicting. And, and we do uh, put too much emphasis on single cases, cases where we have a personal connection with, um, unlike the, the mathematics, which looks at all the, the, the data uh, without uh, probably as much bias as, as we um, put uh, to our, the data that we've connected with, as Mark said uh, to our to our story. Right, Betty. And if uh, people are interested in that uh, little prediction quiz that Ian puts in Super Crunches, it's on page 122 and 123 of the paperback edition of the book. Um, yeah, uh, 
the the psychological research on uh, overconfidence absolutely confirms that we're inclined to um, extrapolate from our own experience, and we have a very small sample size usually, oftentimes only one instance. And uh, social scientists know that uh, larger samples give us much more uh, accuracy in our predictions. Uh, so we tend to just look for a good story and and be satisfied with that because what we have is a very small sample. Uh, obviously, with big data, the, the large quantities of data that are collected now, uh, we can often uh, make much better predictions by um, analyzing those. Uh, if you're interested, there are two books that are especially good uh, in explaining our overconfidence, why our mind tends to uh, rely on um, stories rather than evidence. One is uh, The Drunkard's Walk by Leonard Mladenow, um, and the other is Thinking Fast and Slow by Kahneman. Um, and they present the psychological research. Uh, what Betty has put up now is uh, the readings on big data, which we thought you'd be interested in. Um, Ian Ayer's book covers a lot of uh, general and commercial data analysis, things like uh, dating websites. Uh, the fourth paradigm is scientific data analysis. Um, which is related to um, the subject of the MOOC that we'll be doing next week. Uh, and I just thought the article, How Big Data Saves Lives in New York City, was fascinating because they're actually using these techniques to uh, analyze uh, what, sh what neighborhoods experience um, heavier crime rates and, and so on. And then, obviously, with a new technique, uh, there are challenges. And one of the things that concerns people is uh, the loss of privacy. And uh, the final article is, is on that subject. Oh, great, Marge. Thanks so much. And um, this, is, this is actually our, our tickler uh, to uh, get you interested in the, the subject. Uh, we are having a, a guest presenter with us on uh, the 15th. And uh, there's information of that on the, the website. And so we hope uh, you join us on the 15th um, after viewing this video um, with your questions and comments and um, ideas about this, this very interesting topic that is only going to grow in importance over time. Bye, all. <laughs> OK, bye, everyone.